put yourself in the shoes of the customer, empathise with them and build it around that. It's not about you, it's about them. Yeah, I'm Charlie, your online business manager and WordPress expert. My goal is to assist small to medium business owners build their businesses with a focus on using the internet and online technologies in appropriate and cost-effective manner. People hire me to take the stress out of managing their businesses and allow themselves to focus on what they do best. I have a return guest today. I'm so excited about this. Callum Armstrong, who uh, was episode five on my podcast. Go back and have a listen to our original uh, interview because it was great. We enjoyed it so much that he's come back to talk to me again. He's from Paste and Publish and he's a social entrepreneur and content expert, I think how we, we, I think is what the words were. Um, and we're going to find out more and we're actually going to get down into some really nitty gritty stuff today, which I'm really looking forward to. Bit of a warning, he's going to look at my website <laughs> and I'm going to try and be nice <laughs> and good about it. Anyway, Callum, look, thanks so much for coming back. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we had such a good time the first time. I think it's great we're getting you to do this again. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me back, Charlie. Our, our last our first episode went live yesterday, so it's just great. Like That goes live and boom, we're here. I'm really excited to be talking today about how to improve the performance of your B2B website so that when your ideal customers land on it, it hits. And we're going to be sharing eight tips that you can look at in action in your website today. And then we're going to go through some examples. We'll have a look at yours. I'll, I'll be kind, I promise. And we'll also look at a landing page. So can't wait to get into it. So, yeah, just a warning. You know, a website builder's website is a bit like an electrician's light switch. They're never quite finished. <laughs> All right, so Callum, look, let's have it. Um, first of all, let, tell people a little bit more about yourself. Um, I know that we've got the episode up already, but just give people a bit about who you are, how you've come to be here, and then we can get into it. I just like to do that so people have an idea of who who they're listening to. Awesome, thank you. So, if uh, yeah, if you haven't seen our last episode, I am a marketing coach. I typically focus on content. So creating assets and information that people can use to put it out there once and use it unlimited times to get their ideal customers. Uh, I focus on B2B services. So businesses that solve problems for other businesses. And yeah, I'm based in uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa, and serve clients all over the English speaking world. So that, that's kind of my background in marketing. I've been doing this for the next last six years professionally and, and we are worn a bunch of different hats from building my own businesses to running an agency, being a consultant and now a coach. So when I come to you to, to share how you can improve the performance of your website, it really is from all different angles and, and all different hats that you can set through. Fantastic. Look, and thanks so much for doing that. It just saves so people having to go back and find the other episodes and listen to those to work out who the hell we who the hell are these people yeah. we're listening to. <laughs> Okay, so we've got some tips for people about um, building their websites and things that you need to think about. So I'm going to just throw to Callum, let him start, and I will ask questions as I go along, as I usually do. Cool. Okay, so we're going to share eight tips. Uh, when you're listening to these, I'd like you to think about your own website. And rather than thinking about doing a massive overhaul, sometimes it's needed. Quite often, it's just a few little tweaks that can make a website perform really well and look great. So in an ideal world, if you were to come away from this call, I'd love you to think, what can I do in the next week that's going to make a difference? Um, it's easy to put things off for three, six, 12 months and then realize that you could have just done it in an hour on that afternoon. So with that in mind, let's take a look at it. The first tip is an acronym that I love to share, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? So most uh, B2B websites that I've seen are glorified online brochures. We can provide this, we can provide that, here's our features, here's our services, here's our sales team, here's our testimonials from our customers, you should buy from us, we can do this, here's our pricing. Um, the truth is that no matter how friendly or kind people are to you, 
they're always thinking what's in it for me you're probably thinking listen to this podcast why should i listen to you who on earth are you and why should i give you my valuable time even if right now you're cooking dinner or you're on the treadmill you're still thinking well i've got a hundred million other things i could do and listen to so why should i listen to you so it's better to talk about here's what's in it for you here's uh, what you get out of it here are the benefits and outcomes rather than the features and services of our page even if you're sharing a testimonial here's what customers like you have to say instead of here's what we want to share about our customers it, it, it's a really subtle shift but this can make a huge difference so that's the that's the first one uh, secondly is to speak in the client's tone of voice speak to their pain points speak to their needs if you are copywriting and you're you're doing this yourself, it can be hard to step away from here's what we offer. When you live and breathe in your business every single day and you, you're doing this full time, sometimes even more than that if it's your own small business, uh, it, it's easy to, to think about everything from your perspective. But again, your customers aren't thinking it from your perspective. By the nature of just being human, we're thinking about it from our perspective. They're thinking about it from their perspective. So put yourself in their shoes. This is the same thing if you outsource it to a copywriter. The copywriter doesn't know your customers like you know them. Um, even if you've run your business for the last 20 plus years, you know, you might know your customers really well, but it's easy to slip into certain assumptions and certain ways of thinking. So step outside of that. The easiest way is just to interview your customers and ask them. You know, what are your pain points? Why did you come to me? Uh, how did it feel when, when you realized you had a problem that I could solve? Uh, when you spoke to us, what, what actually about our offer and about our brand and service and people made us seem appealing to you? Um, when you? When you bought from us, what was the mini transformation you went through? How did that impact you, your business, your life? How did it make you feel? How did it make your staff feel? find out these things what was the outcome because of having that outcome what did that unlock in your life and your future and your business and your profits and your growth in whatever area that your b2b service your company is focusing on so ask those questions and then simply just reflect that in your in your landing pages and your service pages and your about us remember like what's in it for me that's what matters right uh, so those are the first two tips do you have any thoughts on that i can yeah, I do actually, because um, they're actually really related. Like the what's in it for me, and look at it from your customer's perspective. You, you've got to do that. If you don't, why are they going to buy from you? Um, and it comes down to, and I'm hopefully you'll get into it, and maybe not. But it's about, yeah, you know, are you talking about the features of what you're doing, or are you talking about the benefits of what you're doing? The benefit is. How does it make your client's life better? How does it make their business better? The feature is, um, I'm going to use a car example because that's the one I remember from my sales training all those years ago is it's got a V8 engine in it. Well, that's a feature or it's got heated seats. That's a feature. The benefits are, well, the V8 engine goes faster and it goes vroom, vroom. Um, you know, for some people that's a benefit. For um, that, heated seats means that, you're going to be warm. Your backside's going to be warm. Your back's going to be warm when you get into a cold car of a morning. So that's the difference between your benefits and features. And it also answers your questions about what's in it for me. Why am I doing this? Why am I spending my time with you? So yeah, idea. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly, hundred percent. And if you're not sure how uh, how to figure this out, we I have created a customer interview toolkit. Uh, we shared it in the last podcast episode, but yep. if you like, I can provide that link and we can put it in the show notes. So if you I'll just absolutely like to put all of this account. into the show notes, cool. yep. Awesome. So yeah, free of charge, no login, no email required or anything. Just use it, ask the questions and it'll make your life easier. Um, yeah. So that's the, that's the next thing. The, the next is uh, what I like to call what is commonly known as above the fold content. So when someone lands on any page of your website, whether it's your homepage, your services page, a blog, uh, even if they're watching a video, the first the first few seconds is where you've got to hook them. So think about the journey of you consuming a piece of content, whether it's going to someone's sales page or reading something educational or watching a video for that matter. Uh, 
the first thing you see is what's the title of the page and what's the meta description or, or if, if you're looking at it on the search engine if you're looking at it on a you're already on someone's website and you click to another page you're like is this title what i'm looking for am i finding what i need and then when you land on the page you're typically going to read the first few words the, the first thing that shows up on your page uh in a bit more detail and if you feel that this is the right thing for you you're hooked in then you'll pay more attention to the rest of it if you're not sure you're either going to leave or you're just going to skim through it and, and just be a skim reader like most of us are right so the the first five to ten seconds is so critical no matter what type of information you're consuming even if it's just a conversation with someone so give your juiciest stuff up front uh and you know i i, I Feel like a bit of an imposter here because i preach this but i was writing a sales page for our coaching service which i'll show you a bit later and and i sent it to my coach who does a lot of copywriting coaching and she said oh you're above the cut fold content is terrible <laughs> you know it's the worst part of your page and i was like oh man i teach people how to do this and i'm missing it myself I, so God, it's really i know <laughs> so we can, even the most seasoned people can forget this uh but think about the user like hook them at the start think about any movie tv show uh any type of content that engages you you're always getting hooked at the start and just like at the start of this podcast episode i said look we're going to show you how to how to improve the performance of your b2b website and we're going to give you eight things you can take away right now that's the hook right so think about that for any page on your website so I just want to actually, um, first of all, when you talk about above the fold, if you could just explain that, I know oh, what yeah. you mean, but if you could just explain that, because I know that people are going to be going, what? The pages don't fold, yeah. they're on a computer. <laughs> so I, I think this comes from the newspaper days, but don't quote me on it that. Does. And, um, no, it does. Absolutely yeah. it does. <laughs> okay. Above the fold is just what you see when you first load your screen. So it's just what shows up when you first click on a page. Um, before you scroll. Yeah, absolutely. And it does come from newspaper days when you used to get the tabloids and the bigger, bigger forms and they'd fold them in half and they'd put the headline um, face up. So when you looked at the newspaper, yeah. you oh, want to see that. I mean, if you're looking at it in terms of magazine content, when you're st sitting there at the um, shopping, shopping center, uh, the, the grocery line, and they've got the magazines there, they've got the stuff on the front page, that's the above the fold content stuff that's going to hook you in to make you read. Um, I just wanted to add to that. So I, I see so many websites when I go into them and or people give me stuff. They're like, I just want this video on the page. I don't want them to see anything else. I just want the video to come up. And I'm like, no, you need to have something more because people, not everyone responds with video. Not everyone responds just with text. You've got to sort of have... A balance of things but when you when you go to a website and the only thing that loads is essentially a blank screen no one's going to stop well very few people are going to stop very few people are actually going to want to scroll through they're going to go i don't even know if i'm on the right page i'm going to keep going because i'm looking for an answer to this question and it's just a thing that i i find when i go through things absolutely and, and yes people consume content in different ways one person wants it written the next wants a video the next wants an audio or an infographic uh the next just skims your headlines and, and designs but there's also where are you connecting from are you in a rural area where you've got a really low bandwidth and the video doesn't load well you've lost those people is it someone who's blind um they're probably not going to read it right so they might need to hear it is it you, you know there's all these different accessibility challenges that when you're whipping up a page, you don't necessarily think about, but again, it's everything we're talking about comes to putting yourself in the customer's shoes and, and thinking through empathy for them. But how that practically plays out is what we're talking about today. Absolutely, so there you go. So just something that I always bear in mind when I'm looking at my above the fold content, um, at, for clients, I don't know about my own stuff. I haven't even actually gone back and looked at it specifically. <laughs> Well, I tell you, um, but when I'm looking at it for my clients, it's like, okay, they want to do this. What is it? The what's the piece of information that's going to hook um, attention and draw people to read down the page? So there you go. Absolutely. That's tip three. Yeah, 
<laughs> and so you've hooked people, you've got the above the fold content there, they're thinking, I'm in the right place, I've got the right thing, you are who I need. Now, the next thing I see people drop off on is not thinking about the journey that the customer or the user is going through. Uh, again, many B2B service websites are like online brochures, right? They say, we offer this, we offer that, buy this, buy that. Um, it's really tempting to put a whole load of information on your page and just dump it in whatever order you think is best. Um, but what takes a good website with great information to a, a fantastic website with the same great information is the order in which we give it and the calls to action we give and the titles and all these little elements is, is what turns the website from an average experience to a great one. So make the journey obvious. When someone lands on a page on your website, what do you want them to do? If they land on your homepage, do you want them to uh, find your services? Do you want them to sign up to your newsletter? Is that is that the goal? Is it that you just want them to read your About Us page and get to know your team? If, let's say you're a mortgage broker and you want them to find their local broker, you don't want them to fill out a generic contact form because you just got to get your assistant to reroute it to someone. So think about the journey. A service pages or a landing page is really obvious because you want them to inquire or to buy. Um, contact page is obvious. Home page is not necessarily as obvious because there can be multiple priorities on it. Um, yeah, so think about the journey. Think about um, put yourself in a customer's shoes. When you're just, and, and this isn't just a static one-off event, right? I mean, you can just build a website and think this is perfect, but until you get data on how people are using your website, you can't know for sure. There's a really good app called Microsoft Clarity. It's free. You install it really easily on your website, and then that will get heat maps of how people are moving through your site. You can look at individual people, how they move their mouses, where they click, where the dead spots are. And so then you can see how people are using your site. And over time, you can then refine and improve your site based on the real-time data of how people are using it. Um, that's, but again, it depends how invested you are in the success and in the, um, the perfection is not the right word, but it depends how invested you are in your website. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every website has to be just as good as Amazon.com because that's simply not true. If you're a consultant with one to five staff and your business relies largely on doing a good job for people and your website is supporting that, you know, you're probably going to build it once and maybe look at it in a few years' time. And I'm not saying that's a, wrong, a bad thing, but, you know, keep in mind how invested you are in in your website and if you do want to really keep refining it then use an app like clarity to refine based on real-time data um, but it's, it's not essential it's just a um it's like that next step you, you know you can do things good enough or you can do them fantastic uh yeah so number five so um Sorry, do you have any thoughts on yep. that yeah no, no 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 I, I agree entirely that that you can't have too much data would be my first statement. Um, if you're collecting the data and you're not using it straight up, that's okay. Make sure you've got it that you can go back to and say what, what has been happening when you're ready to do it. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of setting up your analytics today. And I've quite often had people say, oh, well, why should I bother with that? I don't need the data now. And I've said set it up now <laughs> like you need to set it up now because if you want it later then you don't have it um yeah even if you never use it at least you've got it yep absolutely i agree so the next tip is share your customer love um testimonials case studies customer stories proof of the results you get people people trust their peers more than they trust you Unless you're a long-term customer, you've done a great lot of stuff, in which case they're still going to come back to you regardless of how good your website is. Uh, but for those people that aren't your customer yet, show them how other people have got results. And people often ask me, yeah, but do you really read those testimonials and believe them? Um, does it actually make a difference? And I, as a marketer, we're always the most skeptical of others' marketing. But the answer is yes. You know, even... 
like when I go shopping, let's say to book a, an Airbnb, I think, oh, these reviews might be bogus. It might just be their friends. Does it, is this really the experience? Is it actually legitimate? But then when I start shopping through Airbnb, I go to the five star reviews. I read a few and think, oh, this looks like a good host. Then I'll look at the one star reviews and think, oh, these people are probably people that just like to complain. Then I'll go to the two and three stars and see what people that are probably a bit more reasonable think. And then I look at those and I say, okay, I'm going to book it. So when I look at reviews, I think, oh, this is bogus, but then it's actually how I behave. And I've seen that from so many other people. Like, you know, we are, we're herd animals, you know, we're, we're tribal animals by our genetics and how we evolve. Like no matter how many roofs and buildings and shoes and, and tools we have around us, we're still like at its core, we, we're, we're still driven by what does the group think? Um, so share that, use that to your advantage. If you're not, then you're missing out on all this potential. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, it was something that I was taught when I first was doing sales is that people don't like to feel that they're alone. They like to feel that they're part of something bigger. So doing the testimonials, showing people that the other people are using your services, having the positive reviews are great. Having negative reviews is also good, honestly, because it does, as Callum said, give you that sort of spread that people go, well, maybe they're not maybe they're okay because they're getting positive and negative reviews. Everyone makes mistakes. Not everyone is your, is your ideal client. Not everyone is your client and they try to be your client. Um, and, yeah, sometimes you look at those one stars and reviews and think, oh, you're just people who just are review bombing, I know. Cool. And just on that, I had to buy some sh a sheet set recently. And uh, was it the sheet set? No, it was the doona. I needed a doona, a duvet. Um and I'm looking, and I'm honestly, it was the difference between a $27 duvet and a $45 duvet. It wasn't an expense. I'm not spending a lot of money on this. But I still went and looked at the review. <laughs> to yes, decide which one I wanted. And I looked and I went, oh, so these one one, these one stars, these people are really not happy with it. And there wasn't that many. And there was an awful lot of five star reviews, not too many three and four star reviews. And I thought. So the people that have probably given up one star reviews are just the people that really, really hated it. And it wasn't because it was as bad as they're saying. It's just something didn't gel with them. Yeah, yeah. I used to have a, a, a skincare brand that used native plant extracts like Manuka oil from New Zealand Ooh, nice. to, to create plant-based skincare that helped to plant native forests around the country. I sold it last year. It wasn't really my place in the world. But... That's exactly it. Like we had these amazing products and from time to time you would get someone that would buy it and then they'd send this really aggressive email that give a really bad review. They'd say, oh, you know, your product's terrible. It took a day longer than it should have to get here and all these bad things. And I say, okay, look, um, that's fine. You know, I obviously wouldn't say it to them, but I think, well, you're, you're one of these people that will complain about everything and get something for nothing. So, you know, here's your money back. Keep the product. Um, let me know if there's anything yep. you can do to help. It's just not worth um ruffling up those feathers because you know if, if you've got someone like that in your yes. audience which every every audience has someone like that and you get them across your business like don't don't pick a fight with them just let, let it be right my, my my first boss had this saying uh he said the customer isn't all, always right but if you treat them right they'll always be your customer yeah my, like look, my 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 favorite is thank you very much for your feedback Mm. thank you and for look, your feedback you can, and it just takes the often it just takes the wind out of their sails because they're like oh oh <laughs> if you can do a good job for the perpetual complainer and you can make them happy or at least make them not more angry then you're doing a good job for everyone <laughs> it benefits all of your business more not like that not more angry <laughs> just keep yeah. them at that level <laughs> And, and, and as a basic PR, like if, you, if you're getting bad reviews, um, don't ignore them and don't fight against them. You know, say thanks. Uh, with, you know, I appreciate your feedback. If they put this on Google or Facebook, reply to them. Say thanks, I appreciate your feedback. Uh, Absolutely. Can we, if you have any further feedback to help us improve and do a better good job for future customers, can you please let us know, you can email us or, or, or respond to this comment. Um, and we want to do a good job and we appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Um, 
there's always this little bit of your ego that's like, no, they're wrong. <laughs> Keep in mind, like, you, if you have a business, you have uh, a, an asset that, that has an equity that's some kind of multiple of your earnings. And if they show you a way to better serve your customers and keep them for longer and get more of them, then they're actually an asset to your business, not a liability. And, you know, it's all about perspective, right? Yep. And look, I, I, again, just on that, I, you, you mentioned Google reviews and I've seen businesses that have been review bombed um, for whatever reason, a group have just decided they don't like the business. They're just going to go out and give it a heap of one star reviews. You can tell they're fake reviews when you're reading them. You know that they're not real. Uh, and they're like, well, we've just got to delete them. Well, well, first of all, you can't. The platform does not allow you to remove negative reviews. Um, and the best thing I have ever told someone to do is respond and say, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. I'm actually having trouble finding your order or finding the service that you took in my system. Would you please contact me, either respond here or send me an email and give me the details so that I can investigate this further and address the issue for you. And when you get no response, you know that that's a fake review <laughs> pretty much. And because, but because you're responding like that, people are reviewing it going, yeah, you're not only looking at your reviews, you're also interested in fixing the issue. Yeah, absolutely. And if you do, if you have good products or services and you do a good job for clients and there's continual complaining and this happens for years on end, that's when you should say, hey, am I targeting the right audience? Um, I had a client who supplied stuff to, uh, he, he supplied equipment to people that were sort of 80 plus years old and he most of it was sold online and there were certain accessibility challenges and he was finding that even if he did a great job and went above and beyond to the point where he's losing money on every order he would still have people complaining all the time and after years of this he decided okay some of the people in my audience this is where they're getting their entertainment from so um there's just a, a bit of an abstract example um no, nothing against people who are retired like it's awesome um but in that example you know the, the particular people that his advertising attracted were those that just look were looking for some kind of complaint right um yeah and you know what if you're getting continual complaints or continually bad reviews and they have a common theme you need to look at that that's serious stuff if it's a continually common theme and it's been going on forever even if it's not all the time but you get one a month or two a month that are saying this that's like that's a that's a point for improvement yeah absolutely absolutely so it might be about your service it might not be but either way it needs to be addressed um so so moving on to the next thing uh, as far as websites go, your website isn't a scrapbook. It isn't a collage of different things off Pinterest. You should have consistent branding, a consistent look. You should have consistent fonts and spacing. If there's any typos, you should avoid them. Like This sounds really fundamental, really basic, but the amount of times I go into a website, they have like five different fonts. They have six different colors that don't gel together. They, they have some kind of stock image of some aspirational people in a corporate office and then they've got red text over it that gets lost in some areas. It's way too common. Uh, and, and usually this is when someone's uh, outsourcing it to the cheapest person they can find to build their website and they're not paying attention to the product and they're just focused on what they do. Um, you know, this, this happens, but think about the experience for the user. If you have consistency of your branding, it says this is the professional outlet that, that is going to do a good job and treat us well yep. and again i'm just going to say when people come to me and talk to me about i uh, developing their website and you're developing their business the first thing i do is put them through branding um now they don't have to take that but if they don't take it or don't come to me with a brand kit and can't give me a brand kit and then don't want to develop a brand kit they have to understand and i'm, I'm very very upfront about it's going to be very difficult 
to make this look as good as everything else because you don't know what your look and feel is. You don't know what your brand is. So when someone's offering you a branding kit or the ability to do your branding, absolutely take it. Um, it will save you forever and ever and ever. So, so Charlie, looking at your services, uh, do you provide the branding or do you work with designers? How, how does that work? If I have a... Things? I have um, a team and when someone comes to me, one of the things I do is send them off to that person to have a chat to them um, about their branding and get their branding kit done and their logo done and put it through. So I don't think I had that on my website yet because that has sort of evolved over the last 18 months where I went, you know what, this is just something I have to start for because yeah. people aren't... You, trying to find people to do it is also difficult. Like trying to find good people who have got the availability to do it. Like good people don't have the availability because they're good yep. pretty much. <laughs> but yeah, Absolutely. it's it's really, really important. Even if it's just, um, yeah, you get the PDF document that says, this is your logo, these are your colors, this is the font we've used or the fonts we used. And my recommendation is no more than two or three fonts. Don't do any yep. more than two or three fonts. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, one thing I learned the hard way with fonts is uh, it depends on how polished you want to be. But if you're not looking to be the next Main Street brand, try to avoid fonts that you have to buy. There, there are thousands and thousands of free fonts that are great. Um, in their skincare Google business, fonts, man. Google yeah, fonts, so man. <laughs> Go to fonts.google.com. If, if you're doing it yourself or you're just in that brainstorming set area and look at look at it there's so much there and if you are going to work with a designer typically one of the first things they'll say is send us a bunch of brands you like and tell us what you like and don't like about them go on pinterest look on look at companies and, and identify what you like and don't like listen to your yep. your internal feedback and, and Think about what do I like? Whether you're doing this yourself or whether you're going to a designer, it's going to take you three steps ahead and potentially also cut the cost of getting to the same outcome anyway. Absolutely. And the other thing I'm going to add to that is then when you want to go into your merch, like I noticed um, Callum's wearing his Paste and Publish shirt there. Um, so when, <laughs> but when you go to your, when you go to your merch and when you want to start, you know, go out and do things or meet people and you want to have a shirt that's got your logo on it and has your business name on it, you've got it all there. You can just take it to someone and say, there's my logo. It's in high quality format. I want that embroidered onto my shirt. I want the shirt to be this color and you're not always going to get the same color that you're, um, that, that's in your brand kit, but you're going to get close. You're going to get that. So it's all going to be themed all the way through. If you then decide you want to get your car wrapped and have, you know, the decals on your car and stuff, you've got it all there and it's the same. They go to your website, they look at your car, they look at your clothing, they look at um, the the church keys that you're giving out and it's all the same. Yeah, and it's an investment. It's not a cost. Um, if you're thinking of design and branding as, as an expense, then that's the wrong perspective to look at it from. Because if you do it right up front, uh, you can use it for years. Uh, you'll see the background in this video. Uh, you're only seeing a little snippet of it. But this is this beautiful background I got done four years ago. And I still use it on every single Zoom call. Uh, y you know, it's this, this logo. Yeah, sure, it costs some real money when I started and it, it took a bit of time to and, and a bit of mental investment into what I actually like and working waiting for the time for a good designer to be available as well um, but now it's looking great and I haven't had to change anything in four plus years and we can put out really polished comms with minimal effort and if I have to get my designer to illustrate something she can jump straight into it and she can do magical stuff in minimal time because we had that upfront investment absolutely I, I look i just can't i can't highlight how important it is just even building a website for someone knowing what their fonts are knowing what their colors are you then set up their style sheet and go i need a heading one heading ones are always this color unless i've got a reverse and then i've got a reverse heading one that i can use for that um, I think the other thing that I wanted to just add to that is that 
if you're just starting out, you don't need to go to the um, designer who would have done the Apple logo or the IBM logo or the Google logo. You don't need someone that high and that that great. There are people that work in the low to mid ranges that do great jobs. And as a startup, use them. Then as you grow, if you need to revise your marketing, if you need to revise your branding, you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I've often or sometimes heard that a website has a three to five year shelf life, more probably more on the three year end. Think about that with your branding. If you've only got a few hundred dollars to spend, get get something basic in place. Um, that, that looks good enough. Go out and get sales, serve customers, get them results, do a good job. Um, and then next time you come to update your website, get your branding done. You know, make the money, set aside a percentage of your revenue to your marketing, branding, yep. online assets, investment. And when you've got enough in the kitty to do it or when you're ready and when you, if you want to take it to the next level, then polish it up, you know. It's much easier to polish something that you've already got than it is to start from polished, um, yeah. I think one of the other things we should just cover in that is um, your colours and by all means have an idea of what colours you want but be open to take feedback. I that The amount of times I have people come to me and say, I just want hot pink. <laughs> I just want um, black. I just, just black. And I, I, I okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it's all a journey, right? So, you know. Yeah. So, all, but have an idea of what your colours are. Have an idea of what you want your look and feel to be. Um, the best thing I can tell you is know who your target audience is because that's going to inform so much of what you do with your brand. <laughs> yeah. And that comes back to what we were talking about earlier is put yourself in the shoes of the customer, empathise with them and build it around that. It's not about you, it's about them. Uh, so, so the seventh tip for improving your B2B website is optimizing your pages for SEO, search engine oh, yes, optimization. Oh, yes, so this please. isn't relevant to all of us. Uh, some people have services that are very niche that don't have people searching for them. Uh, it's not super common, but uh sometimes there is nobody searching for it but for most most businesses there there is something that people will search to find your service on google if you're a a mortgage broker and you're giving people first home buyers it'll be like first home loans you know first home buyers mortgages um or interest rate renewals it might be what it might be obvious what people are searching it might not be what you think um, now, this isn't a whole lesson on how to optimize your website because there's we could talk for days on end about it, right? But uh, but have a look. There's a lot of free tools. Ubersuggest is a good one that you can do a few free searches on, ubersuggest.com. Uh, but there are many others if you've got a preferred tool. And go to your country where your customers are and search, find, find content ideas and, and see what people are searching. Uh, yeah. And put those keywords into your into the your website URL, so the website address of that page, put it into the, the main header, the meta title, uh, where it's relevant, put it into subtitles. But don't do this above giving the good user a good experience. Because remember, your search engines respond to the way that users behave on your page. So if people click on your page, they stay you. there, they find what they want, you will be performing even if you don't have the keyword exactly correct. If you try and over optimize to the point where you're stuffing all these keywords in and it's a bad experience, people leave the page, doesn't matter how many boxes you're ticking, you're not going to perform because it doesn't give users what they want. Search engines want you to go back to them. Google wants you to search and click and come back every single time you need some information so that they can show you ads every single day for the next decade. Um, and then they can sell those ads to advertisers. So giving the user a good experience means that that reflects well on the search engine that referred them. And so that's, yeah, a bit of a caveat there. Yeah. So um, first of all, I do actually have a book, Get Ranked in 11 Steps. Oh, cool. um, Dot com get ranked in 11 steps. I think it's get ranked 11 steps.com. I will make sure I put that in the um, 
<laughs> in the show notes. It's an, it's a little older. It does need to be uh, revamped again because the algorithms and things change. Uh, but it was about setting up your WordPress website to do uh, SEO and doing your, what we call on-page search engine optimization. The other thing I do want to just highlight with that is uh, sometimes your writing rules go out the window when you're writing for search engine content. So whereas you might normally bold words because uh, that's that's the way it's done in English, let's talk English because that's what I write in. Uh, when you're writing for search engines, sometimes you will bold other words. The, the words that are important to the searches are what you need to highlight, not words that are important to make a sentence flow. I mean, that's not quite right, but it's the intent of it. Um, and just make sure that you're writing for humans, not writing for the search engines. Take all of everything that you, you, you learn and you do and write for a human. People can tell the difference between content that's written for search engines and con content that's written for humans. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's quite funny. I've been in the search engine optimization space for probably less less than I think you've been involved in it, given that you've got a book and everything. But I have been doing this for about six years now. And every six months, all these supposed gurus come out saying, hey, there's this latest thing, you've got to do that hack. At the moment, it's generative search optimization um, and how you need to put out a thousand blogs with AI. And it's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> but, but the, don't the do that. <laughs> The underlying foundations, you know, the things that actually matter haven't changed much in the last five plus years. Um, yeah, there's little tweaks on how you execute on that that have changed. But ultimately, like search engines want to sell their users advertising, so they need to give a good experience and solve people's problems as fast as they can so that you come back every day for the next 10 years. Like if you give users that experience, you focus on what people are searching for and, you know, look at Charlie's book. Take the best practices. Some specifics might change. Um, if you're a small okay, business and you just... 17 years. Up, I've done it for 17 it. years and the basics haven't changed. Yeah, I still write the same way for search engines as I did 17 years ago. And I still get the same sorts of results. I can still get a site listed in 24 hours that's the first thing is getting it listed and generally it will list on the first or the second page hmm. yeah keeping, and, and keeping like, it there might be a bit of a challenge but you can generally get it listed because you've hit all of the things the search engines need to get it listed and get it up there and start for, for people to find it absolutely and and you know when this ai boom was really taking off early last year. I had this client website and we had really invested in doing all the best practices with their blog for a few years before that. And, you know, we thought, uh, are they gonna disappear in the rankings because all the competitors are gonna put out all this cheap copycat content that's AI generated to tickle the best practices. You know what actually happened was their, their traffic, I don't know if it doubled or tripled, but it just absolutely blew up and that wasn't because of some fancy hack it was because of we were just doing the basics day in day out you know for years coming up to it and they're getting massive traffic and you know it's not because of some fancy suit it's because just doing the basics right so yeah um I, I, just to answer the questions that people are asking just you're not there to um give an sorry you're not there to say we do this you need to think about we do this because the client wants this thing so the question the client is asking is this answer that question and if you answer that question because they're going to go to google and they're going to say um what's the one i had yesterday oh how do i fix my sirocco fan <laughs> how do i fix my so i typed it in how do i fix my sirocco fan and i had things come up for the sirocco fan that wasn't what i was looking for no one's done what i wanted to do that's okay <laughs> people will type in the question they want so why not give them the answer why not put that into your keywords and into your text like you often you may be asking how do i fix my sirocco fan there you go yeah and that that is all publicly available if you want to get into seo 
Um, but again, you decide if this is a priority. If if it's not right now, just try and get the you know get the right keywords yep. on your service pages at least. Um, and then the last the last point, uh, the last tip to improve the performance of your B two B website. Uh, this ties into a much bigger topic, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But capture and nurture your leads. So uh, on average, about three percent of any audience is ready to buy right now. That can change depending on uh, the business, the industry, the audience. But most people aren't ready to purchase. If your website is just a glorified online brochure, then you're hoping that the people that you're trying to serve, uh, when they are ready to buy, they find you, or they know about you before they're ready to buy and they remember you somehow, um, that when they go on your website, everything appeals to them, that they get in touch, that you have a conversation with them, and that they convert. That's a lot of uh, a lot of filters and conditions that need to be met for them to buy from you. Uh, if 97% of your audience aren't ready to buy, what do you do? Because a lot of them are thinking about, do I go for you or for someone else? So they might be aware of their problems, but not aware of that you can even solve their problems. They might not even be aware that there's a problem, but somehow they landed on your site. So this is where a lead magnet comes in handy. Do you want to explain what a lead magnet is, Charlie? Oh, I absolutely do. Because um, I'm, yeah. I'm very, very big on when I set up client sites to make sure we do something similar to this. Um, so a lead magnet is the thing that you offer that has value to to your client not to you to your client or to your visitor in return for them giving you their email and their name their email address and their name and sometimes their phone number depending on how your marketing works but there is so much competition out there for that email address and there is so much don't you say that word charlie junk coming to people's inboxes because they've given their email address when they've gone to a website and they're just spammed all the time that people don't like doing it. So you've got to offer something of value to them to give them that. And that's what your lead magnet is. Absolutely. Nailed it. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of crappy lead magnets out there. The amount of times I've given my email address and someone's given me a 500 word um, Google document that's got typos and, and, and stuff in it, or it's just some spreadsheet that's meant to be some kind of tool that you can use and it's just terrible, um, or the design doesn't fit. Well, you know, if you're going to do a lead magnet, do it right. The way I like to think about a lead magnet is does this solve your ideal? customer's problem on a silver platter that they can then go and action and is it something that they would happily pay even just a few dollars for but they get for free so as an example i used to have this client who they they did an accounting software that would take your uh, your shopify or your amazon or your ebay account and automate putting all that data into your accounting system which was before that was a major hassle and caused a lot that's of accounting. amazing that's yeah. amazing <laughs> accounting uh, a2xaccounting.com if you're interested amazing stuff we actually grew their uh, their website traffic more than 10 times in 18 months just from blogging without paying for any of the clicks had tens of thousands of new visitors to the month to their website it made sense to build their own internal team so kind of like handed it over but yeah a really cool team really cool app uh but the the point i'm making here is what how do we go from someone's got a problem that their accounting's an issue that they might not even realize it to realizing that a2x was the right solution so we spoke with some of the leading online e-commerce accountants and we found that people don't realize all the processes that are required for financial management of an online store so we then went out and we created the e-commerce bookkeeping checklist. This was like a 35 page document with um, this crazy spreadsheet that came with it all for free. It had over a hundred processes in it, uh, split into the things you need to set up every day, week, month, quarter, year for every department of your financial management from accounts payable, accounts receivable, inventory, CFO duties. Uh, there was like eight different 
many departments in your e-commerce business to go from you know five or six figures to seven or eight figures uh, and then it was split also based on phases so the first phase is these are the essential things to set up second phase do these third phase do these and then we partnered with some other accountants that co-created with us and we promoted it to shared audiences and then we uh we basically for each process we'd say do this if we had a blog on our website or one of our partners websites that showed them how to do it or shared more insight we'd say read this blog and then we had another section in the spreadsheet saying this is how our app can help to make it easier for you so then someone goes from oh my accounting's a mess my bookkeeping's a mess to hey i can uh I, I can just use this checklist to set up all the processes, hand it off to my assistant or do it myself, uh, to, oh, there's some blogs that'll show me exactly how to do it, to, oh, actually, I can just automate this with two clicks of a button with your app. I better sign up for your 14-day free trial. So can you see how that's gone from someone's on your website, they're not ready to buy yet, they might be reading a blog, but they're just thinking about information, they've got a problem, they've got 100 million different distractions in front of them right now, to, oh, that's a no-brainer, like, I would have paid you 10, 20, 50 bucks for that like blueprint of all the processes to, oh, well, now it makes sense to sign up for your offer. Uh, look, I, I actually like to, um, when I'm doing my lead magnets and stuff, it's like, okay, so I'm going to give you the steps to do something. I'm going to show you how you can implement this in your business yourself. If you have the time and the inclination to do it, you can take what I'm giving you and go and do it. That's not a problem. So it's a value to people. The upshot of it is, is that 80% of those people are going to go, I don't want to do this myself. Can you do it for me? Yeah, of course I can. Absolutely. But if you want to do it, there it is right there. You can go and do it. I'm not making this so hard for you that you can't do it yourself. Yeah, and and I think the old school business view of this is, oh, I shouldn't give stuff away for free. Like they're just going to go and do it themselves. Like if they're going to do it themselves, they weren't going to buy from you. They're anyway. going to do it themselves and, anyway. <laughs> and some of them are going to try to do it themselves, realize it's a hassle, and come back to you. And if they were going to do it themselves, it's better that they find the answers from you than someone else, and they talk good about you instead of someone else. Um, but of course, once someone signs up for that download, you need to nurture them. So this is where an autoresponder sequence comes in place. This is a yeah. series of pre-written emails that get sent out on scheduled days or time. So it might be every day or every three days after they signed up. Normally it's somewhere between four and 10 uh, emails. And the, the purpose of this is to warm people up, to provide them extra education and health and training, to give soft calls to action and eventually get them to buy from you. Uh, yeah, so those are the eight eight points. Uh, do, we, do we have time to go through a couple of examples or? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to come back to um, you said autoresponders. Uh, I'm noticing that more and more of the CRMs and the uh, systems out there are calling them automations. So just so people sort of get that translation because it tripped me. I can't believe it tripped me up. I'm like, oh, I want an autoresponder. Oh, you've renamed that. <laughs> it's an automation now. Um and there's any number of things that you can put into that 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 autoresponder to keep people warm, and that's the sorts of advice that we can offer you offer you as well. Alrighty. So um, what we're going to do, guys, is I know we said at the beginning of the call that we'd actually do some practical examples. I we have just looked at the time and gone, wow, we've spoken a heap here. Um, so what we're going to do do is Callum has agreed to come back and we're going to do some practical examples in the next call uh, which will be great and then he can be really hard on me and how bad my website is and you can see <laughs> you can see all the things uh, but I think what we'll do quickly here Callum is a, if you don't mind I will do my locals call uh, my cool. locals throw and I'm so guys you're going to get a read in this so being a business business owner can be tough being a business owner who works remotely can get lonely and frustrating that's why I started my locals community a community for business owners that can be a bit like the water cooler of old treat my locals community as a place where you not only get to interact with me but with each other you can gain inspiration from others provide inspiration and advice and of course as supporters you'll be able to ask questions of myself and interact with me 
Supporters, it costs two dollars US per month, which is less than the cup a cup of coffee. I know that's a really old thing to say, isn't it? Less than a cup of coffee, and it really is these days. But it's two dollars US per month. That does a couple of things. First of all, it says that you're really keen to be part of the community. It does stop the trolls and the spammers coming along and just, you know, putting up comments as they as they want which we all then go this is useless we don't want to be part of this uh, but you also allow me to keep creating content like this like my tutorials like my daily inspirations that are going out so come along and join me at askcharlieletham.locals.com and back to us so do you want to do us a recap Callum Awesome. Yeah, fantastic. So we have summarized eight tips to improve the performance of your B2B website, uh, all centered around being empathetic about your customer, but practical ways that you can show that on your site. We tried to share some examples, but we got a bit late on the timing. So we're going to do that next time. And uh, just as a, as a last point, if you do want help with improving the performance of your B2B website, we are running a coaching program called Evergreen Leads. And in that, we will show you exactly how to do it. We'll walk, work with you to make this happen. And where you have uh, the desire to get outside help, like Charlie, uh, we will then put you in touch with Charlie and other people like Charlie to make it happen. Uh, so yeah, if, if you want to get your website performing and you value that, and you, you just want to make sure it's done right, and you want advice and guidance and training along the way, then yeah, get in touch. Uh, paceandpublish.com slash evergreenleads. Perfect. And I will make sure I've got that all in the uh, comments below, in the show notes below, so that we can you can get in touch with Callum. Um, honestly, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, he doesn't know this yet, but I'm about to speak to him about one of my clients as well to see if he can help me out there, which would be great. Uh, so if you've got any comments at all, please let us know in the comments. Uh, we will respond to you. Uh, if you've got questions that you want to ask for us to cover later, because Callum has agreed to come back at least one more time and maybe more if I, if I, if I ask him nicely. But leave some comments, leave some questions. Uh, if we don't answer them actually in the comments ourselves, we may actually do an episode specifically around that for you. Uh, remember to like this video, subscribe to my channel, ring the notification bell so you find out when I drop more content. And if you're listening to this on a platform that allows you to leave reviews per one of our little tips today, please do leave a review. Um, five stars, love five stars, they're great. Uh, but you know, any comment, any review that uh, helps me improve, I will take and be ever grateful for. So thanks guys and thank you, Alan for being part of it today thank you charlie yeah and we'll see you next time see you next time guys cool cheers